So last week we talked about how a journey of 360,000 miles begins with one step. We talked about how we often fall down on this journey, how we, how we stumble and we fall. We talked about how with Jesus' help we can stand and we can walk with him. How Jesus helps us up and helps us continue on that journey. Well, Today we're going to talk about that journey, that hard, scary journey. But I also said that our journey has a destination. And it's a destination that we've been given. And if that scares you, maybe you should listen to a story of another who was sent. Only this person wasn't given a specific destination. He was just told to go from your country. I'm going to read to you Genesis 12, 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. The land I will show you. Will? You mean I've got to just go and not know where I'm going? I've just got to pack up all my stuff and go? How would you react if you received a word from God that told you to pack what you could in the car, lock your doors, and go? At 75 years old, pack up your stuff, get in the car, and go. Don't worry about where you're going, just drive. I'll let you know where to turn. I'll let you know when to stop and where to go as you go. But for now, just go. What would your answer be? For me, my answer would be, that's crazy. I need to know where I'm going. I need to know. I need to know what the plan and what the... I need to know. But you know, you may not realize it, but we are faced with these kinds of journeys all the time. Maybe not on such a grand scale, but just as frightening, just as unknowing as Abram's. My call to leave all that I knew and was familiar with in New Jersey and to move up here. Your decisions to step out in faith the way you've been doing lately with the different community-focused ministries and events. I mean, let's face it, when we told people that we were going to serve 1,200 chickens, cooked meals, and they all went, yeah, no, you're not going to do that. But we did. These things are scary. These journeys are scary. And if you take the time to really think about it, we have these journeys all the time. But not all our journeys are physical ones. Sometimes we're sent on an intellectual one, an an inner journey. So let's read of one of these journeys. I'm going to invite you to turn to John chapter 3. We're looking at verses 1 to 17. It's on page 740 in the Pew Bibles. We have a tradition of reading responsively. So I'll read one verse and you read the next verse and we'll go through It's John chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, page 740 in the Pew Bible, starting with verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. Read verse 2, please. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again or from above. Read verse 4. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Verse 6. Flesh 
You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Verse 8. How can this be? Nicodemus asked, verse 10. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony, verse 12. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Read verse 14 and 15. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Verse 17. God of love, you love the world so much that you gave the most incredible gift. Because of the gift of Jesus, my life will never be the same. Thank you, Father. So spend, Holy Spirit, come upon us in this room and be in these words and in this message. Soften our hearts and our minds and open our eyes and our ears to receive your word today. I pray that this would be your word and not mine. Amen. So we start with Genesis this week, the beginning of the saga of the patriarch that we know as Abraham, but he doesn't get that name until later. For now, he's just Abram, son of Terah, who just died in Haran, which wasn't really home. But it's now where we're in what would become Turkey. And it's a long way from Abram's home. Yet it became the new home. And it was a home that Abram was asked to leave. He was asked to complete the journey his father started. And chapter 11, verse 31 says that Terah set off for Canaan, but he only made it to Haran. Some of you may know what that's like. You had a dream. You were going places. You were going to accomplish things. You had worlds to conquer and dragons to slay, so you set off. But somewhere along the way, you settled in Haran. You didn't accomplish all that you had imagined, but you did well. You didn't conquer the worlds, but you helped make a home for you and your family, and that was enough. What seems so clear and so compelling some years ago seems like a dream you begin to lose when you wake up. You remember that it was wonderful, heart-pounding stuff, but the details slip away like the morning mist as you suit up to face the day. Did Abraham hear those dreams from his father as they sat around the fire in the evenings? Did the lure of that original unknown destination work its way into his soul as he tended the flocks? Well, Genesis 12 says, God called. What did that call sound like? Was there a deep rumbling voice that formed words in Abram's soul, but was thunder to everyone else? Was there, as there so often was in the Bible, a dream that refused to fade into that morning dawn? Or did God sound like Terah, talking of Canaan as though he had been there and was hoping to get back someday? How do you know? That's the question we ask so many times. How do you know? How do you know it's God and not the secret desires of your own heart that you're hearing? How do you know? We want to know. We want to be certain. I mean, they always sound so certain in the Bible. Or do they? Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Does that sound like certainty? 
Oh, sure, the narration says the Lord had said to Abram, but what's said? Go. And there's more about what's left behind than there is about the destination. To a land that I will show you. Will show you. Not that I am showing you. Not that I've written out here in these directions. I mean, there's no map with a line drawn from where you are to where you'll end up. God doesn't seem to ask for certainty. And we don't have Abram's inner dialogue in this story. We don't have the questions that he must have asked, at least in his own head and heart. All we have is his action. So Abram went. That's it. He went and he believed. He went as the Lord had told him, and his uncertainty got him into trouble in in just a few verses. He took wrong steps, at least as much as he took the right ones, but he went. And that's what God wanted, apparently. See, God doesn't want us to wait until we're certain. God doesn't want us to figure it all out first, to download the maps and chart our course. He wants us to move. Well, move where, we ask? Anywhere. Somewhere, as the Lord has told us. We don't know everything, but we know some things. We know God asks us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. We know that Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, and that when you do it to the least of these, you do it to him. Now, maybe that isn't enough to build a life on, but it's a start. And along the way is a blessing, not just at the end. There's a blessing in the going, blessing in the following. There's a blessing in the unseen destination. But friends, it's time to move. Now, Nicodemus had to move too. His journey was different, though. It's not so much the miles that he traveled, rather his understanding grew, or was invited to grow anyway. Yeah, but did he grow? Now, that's a good question. See, Nicodemus, he was a leader of the people of God. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Sanhedrin, the governing body of the Jews in Israel at Jesus' time. He comes at night, maybe because serious study takes place at night, or maybe because he was afraid to be seen associating with this questionable questionable rabbi from the backwoods. He comes with social niceties, a bit of flattery to grease the wheels of conversation, but Jesus immediately changes the subject. Jesus immediately puts him on the defensive. You have to be a different person to be a part of what God has in store. What? Nicodemus is reeling almost immediately. What? He's knocked off his feet and he spends the rest of the conversation just trying to catch up. He makes a feeble joke about climbing back into his mother's womb, hoping to disarm the intensity of the teacher Because being a different person was embedded in a metaphor about birth. Born again, he said, born from above. Now the word in Greek means both things. Born again and born from above. It's a reference to time and to direction. Born again as if the first time wasn't traumatic enough. Again as if the first time wasn't as full of potential as it needed to be. Again as if drawing breath like never before, filling the lungs with more than air, breathing in spirit instead. In addition, spirit from above, as if you were too focused on this life, the one lived out in front of your eyes, and anything invisible isn't real. Anything invisible like love and hope and joy and transformation and possibility isn't what life was about when born from below. It's not a bad life. It's just a shallow one, just a a nose to the grindstone and find your meaning in successes and failures each and every day and not in the love of a creator who stands ready to fill you with vision. Let go, Nicodemus. Let go of the need to control your need to have everything your way. Let go of the belief that you can build a better world, a more vibrant community by shaping it along the lines of your own preferences and understandings. Grab hold of the spirit and be blown about from one world to the next, from one joy to the next, from one soul to the next. 
Be born into a new way of seeing. Let go of what was, no matter how satisfying it may have been. Grab hold of where God is calling you to go, who God is calling you to be. I'm not telling you anything new, Nicodemus. I've been saying these things since I got here, since the beginning of time. This is all I have to say. This is all I know. This God thing, this vision of the people of God, the community of faith, I haven't stopped saying this. And you're a leader of people and somehow don't get it. How can this be, Nicodemus? What did you miss? Get ready, because it's about to get even more intense. I can almost vision Jesus having that conversation with Nicodemus. See, Jesus gave Nicodemus a whole lot of stuff to think about, a lot of stuff to process. And we don't know how it all impacted him, what he went away with that night. But a few chapters later, when the rest of the leaders are complaining that the police didn't arrest Jesus for speaking of the kingdom of God, Nicodemus speaks up and he says, don't we have due process? Now that wasn't an affirmation of faith by any means, but at least he attempted to stand on the side of right. Well, they sneered at him and they accused him of being a hick from the sticks like Jesus. And then Nicodemus shrinks from sight completely. Well, not completely. He doesn't speak again, but he shows up in the darkness again. The afternoon darkness of a weeping world. And he gathers up the body from a horrible death and he wraps it up with about a hundred pounds of spices and he puts it in the tomb of another Pharisee named Joseph. A hundred pounds of spices? Was that really necessary? I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe it was overkill. Uh, going a little overboard. Maybe it was apology spice. Maybe he finally understood what he had missed that night in the darkness and he wanted to make up for it. By bringing so much that he could barely carry it, a penance of spice poured out over a dead body that wasn't going to stay dead, though he didn't know that yet. And summing up this story is a verse we all know. Know by heart. Or know by habit, not yet by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Believes as in puts their life in, surrenders everything to, joins completely and shares the vision. Having a vision means more than a slogan that we can recite, though that can be helpful. It means grabbing hold of the wind. It means leaning into the spirit even when it blows you out of your comfortable spot. The message is, it's time to go. It's time to go inside out. Let's pray. God of reconciliation, you call us into an eternal and grace-filled relationship with you. Because of your great love, you sent the Son and have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which breathes your breath of life within us. Help us to be sustained by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit. May sacrificial love come flowing out of this week. We pray this. Amen.